Hello, and welcome to worship at Orcas Island Community Church. We're glad you're joining us today. We're about to begin, so please grab your Bibles as we prepare to study God's Word. God bless you today as we worship together. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Orcas Island Community Church on this beautiful morning. Would you stand with us as we get ready to worship the Lord? The Bible says, joyful noise unto the Lord. So whether you sound beautiful or not, if you're making a noise, it worships him, it honors him. So we are going to sing out to the Lord this morning. Are you ready? All right. know these, so sing along. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship him.
morning. Would you just give him a shout of praise? Come on. God is good and he has filled this place. Well, amen. Go ahead and have a seat for a moment. Smile at somebody as you're on your way down to your chair. So good to be together today. Let me just grab my announcements real quick. Okay, well, we want to welcome you once again to Orcas Island Community Church. My name is Kimberly, and it is such a joy and a privilege to be here with you this morning and lead you in worship. Welcome to those of you joining us online. We're so glad that you can join us in that way. We do have a few announcements for you as we get started. We want to let you know that there's a worship outline that you can grab as you've walked in. There are some prayer cards and welcome cards in your seat there. We have a newsletter that goes out monthly. That is also in the foyer there for you if you want to grab one on your way out. I want to draw your attention to the section in there that has some praise and prayer. We are a church that prays. We have been praying for you, and we want to know if there is something that we can be standing with you today and in the weeks to come, something that we can pray for you, and maybe something that God has done that we can rejoice with you. We will be having a time of prayer today for those of you joining us online, or even if you're in this room and you would like to share those prayers via text or email, we will be getting those live time today in real time and sharing those. You can keep them anonymous or you can share also the prayer cards. You can drop that in the offering plate today if you'd like to do it that way, but we do want you to know that we are praying for you. Thank you so much for your continued faithful giving to Orcas Island Community Church. As I mentioned, we will have an offertory today, but there are other ways that you can give and be a part of the mission of this church. You can text it, you can mail it in, you can give online, and God bless you as you give. Okay, and now one of my favorite parts of the service this morning is our birthday and anniversary shout outs. So we want to say happy birthday this week to our very own Pastor Ryan Carpenter, Janice Gazelle, Caden Carpenter, Bob Cole, Tom Twiddell, Irene McKinley, Darren Densmore, Dmitry Stankovich, and Marlon Rigsecker. We hope you all have a wonderful birthday week and happy anniversary to Mike and Edie Culper, Robert and Gail Anderson, and Jake and Sharon Moss. So enjoy your celebration. And now I'd like to bring up Pastor Brian for a few more announcements and our call to worship. Yes, my parents are their 50th anniversary this week, so I'm so excited for that. Um, also today, this day is Ryan Carpenter's 50th birthday, and um, he decided to not be here to celebrate with us. He decided to be with his dad fishing in Alaska, and yesterday he sent pictures of, there was, I, <laughs> this is crazy, uh, this massive ling cod, a halibut, and a king salmon all in one day. So anyway, um, dinner at the Carpenters next week. So Kelly, get us ready. Thank you. Um, uh, in two weeks, we are going to be gathered here for our annual meeting after our worship service at noon. And uh, next week, our annual reports will be available so you can look at that. But for members of this church and for those who are interested, we want you to be a part of that with us. Um, we're going to have some more announcements next week about how we're going to do it. We, we are going to have, for those who are at home who still cannot be here, a way for you to join us uh, via Zoom, but we are not going to have uh, any mail-in ballots this year. So more to come on that. Stay tuned, and we'll be sending that out this week. Now, I want to ask you to stand as we worship together and as our, we are called into worship with the words of the psalmist. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us say these words responsibly from Psalm 34. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their cry. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to blot out their name from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. 
The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The Lord will rescue his servants. No one who takes refuge in him will be condemned. Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have come here to worship him.
darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the veil. trumpet sound Oh may I then in him be found Dressed in his righteousness alone And on the stand before the throne Christ alone take our offering at this point. I'm just going to pray for it this morning. God, we thank you for your word that says, as we do good and share with others, that our sacrifices are pleasing to you. And God, as we sacrifice of our resources or even of our time and our thoughts and our prayers, God, we thank you that your word says you will give back, God, as we give as we come as cheerful givers today, Lord, that you would bless us abundantly. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you that we can give from the measure that you've given us for your glory, for your purposes that start here in our community and go out into the world. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. Go ahead and have a seat this morning. Standing here in your presence, in a grace so relentless, I am one. By perfect love, wrapped within the arms of heaven, in a peace that lasts forever, sinking deep in mercy, see, I'm wide awake. Drawing close, stood by grace, all my heart is yours. All fear removed, I breathe you in, I lean into your love. Oh, your love. When I'm lost 
lost, you pursue me. Lift my head to see your glory, Lord of all. So beautiful. And here in you I find shelter, captivated by the splendor of your face. My secret place, and I'm so deep is washing over me your face is all i seek you are my everything jesus christ you are my one desire lord hear my only cry to know you This time we want to dismiss the kids to Sunday school up to fifth grade. Go with God's blessing in ours this time. Thank you, Sunday school teachers, for teaching the little ones. We are going to now enter into a time of prayer together. And in a moment, you'll have an opportunity to share prayer requests, prayer updates, life updates. Uh, but first, before we share together, before we enter into a time of prayer, let us come before the Lord in silence at this time. Lord, your mercies are new every morning, and we give you thanks. And now, continuing in this spirit of prayer, uh, John is going to come around with this microphone. And I'd like to start over here, if we could, um, with a good friend who happens to be in the house. Don, can you introduce uh, your, your guest here with you this morning? You're not flying under the radar today, my man. Uh, Nan, Rancy, Randy and Nancy Rowland, if you'd please stand up, I'd like to introduce you to Randy and Nancy Rowland. We've prayed for them in the past. We continue to pray. Randy needs a kidney, so we're praying for that, but we welcome them. 
Yes. Randy Pastor, and, and uh, it's so good to see you. And, and uh, Randy, it's partially his fault that uh, I'm in the Pacific Northwest. So you can blame him. But uh, we are going to be in prayer for you today, and so glad that you are both here with us today. Uh, my name's Peggy. Our daughter, Tiffany, is in Israel on a school trip with a college history group. Um, they were there for a week, and she developed COVID. Um, she didn't get it the whole two years that we were in lockdown. Anyway, uh, the group had to leave on Friday, so she's there alone. She doesn't speak the language. She tested positive again this morning. She has to test positive two day or negative two days in a row before they let her leave the country. So, I mean, she's okay. She's in a hotel room and she's safe, but if you lift that up in prayer, we'd appreciate it. I'd like prayers for a friend, Kate, who safely returned from Poland, which is a major thank God, and she is in word processing. Good morning, my name is Vicki. And uh, when I woke up this morning, the first thing that came to my mind was, I need to share this with the church. Now, often I'm reluctant to do that, but um, when the Lord speaks, then I will. It's actually for myself. Um, I have a, a swelling in my right, excuse my left <laughs> cheek. And it's been that way for more than a month, maybe six weeks. It's been treated with antibiotics three times. And um, I would ask for the Lord's uh, guidance, both for the dentist and for myself and understanding, because quite literally, it's always in my face. <laughs> and it, it shouldn't be there. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like prayers for my friend Pam, a uh, friend of many, many years, and uh, she's undergoing a, a cancer surgery. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's in the brain. And I just pray that, um, that the Lord will help her and uh, guide her and guide the doctors. Um, thank you. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we come before you today as people in this place gathered to worship you, longing to hear from you, desiring your presence in our lives, and looking to you for hope and healing. Lord, we give you thanks for your goodness to us. You've blessed us far beyond anything we could ever deserve. And we thank you for the beauty of this place, the beauty of your creation, which cries out, which speaks loudly of the glory of God. Lord, as we look to your world, Lord, we see much beauty and much strife. We see both war and peace. We see both disease and healing. And we are people who both mourn and rejoice. And so today, Lord, we desire to do that with, with our brothers and sisters, our friends in this place. Lord, I thank you for all who are in this room, who um, perhaps are here for the very first time for those who are joining us online, wherever they may be in the world, Lord, that all who would be a part of this service would know of your great love for them. Lord, we, we do pray for this world. We continue to pray for the ongoing crisis in, 
Ukraine and for those who are still suffering there. We pray for peace. We pray for wisdom for all leaders who would seek to, to do your will. Lord, we pray uh, for those who are in this country who are experiencing trouble and heartache uh, in the midst of racism and violence and death. Lord, we pray that the church could bring a message of light and hope. Lord, we pray for our leaders. We pray for uh, those elected. We pray for President Biden, for our Congress, for our judges as they prepare to bring big decisions this year. Lord, we pray uh, for those who are part of the leadership of this state, Lord, that, that you would bring wisdom and that you would bring justice uh, to this world, Lord. We pray that your will would be done. Lord, we pray that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, for this congregation, for this island, Lord, as we, we, we pray for uh, our students as they are preparing to end another school year, uh, and for the teachers and staff and administration heading into a summer break, Lord, we pray for those preparing to graduate uh, in, in the next couple of weeks, Lord, during this time of transition, Lord, it, it can be um, both cause for celebration and there can be a lot of question marks as to what's next. So, Lord, for those who are questioning, those who might be in this room or listening with, with questions about what's next, Lord, I pray that they might be able to trust in you more and more with their life and with uh, their love. And for the requests that have been shared today, Lord, we do pray for and give thanks for traveling mercy. We pray for those who are in need of physical healing today. We pray with Vicki and Mary and for Pam and for Tiffany. Lord, we pray for Randy. Lord, that he would be able to receive the right kidney at the right time. Lord, we pray uh, for Pam undergoing surgery. We pray for John, Jen's brother, who's still... Uh, in need of surgery and pray for our brother Gary and, and what's going on within his body and within his uh, neck. Lord, for all those in this room who need your healing, who need your presence, Lord, we look to you today, looking to you as our comfort and our strength, knowing that you will never leave us, you will never forsake us. In all this, Lord, we say thank you and we say Come, Lord Jesus, come. We know that, that it is your return, it is the return of Jesus that will bring about the peace and the glory that we truly desire. So we pray, come, Lord Jesus, come. And in Jesus' name, we all say together, amen. Shall we stand together and remember that God is faithful forever. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father.
summer and winter and springtime and harvest sun moon and stars in their courses above join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness mercy and love great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness lord unto me pardon for sin and a peace that endureth thy own dear presence to cheer and to ten thousand beside <clears throat> great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy hand hath provided Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. Well, it's good to be back with you this morning. I was away last weekend on a prayer retreat, and over the next two years, I'm going to be gone seven more times um, on a prayer retreat. I was just north of Chicago in Mundelein, Illinois, is where I was at. And it's so good to be back with you. I'm so thankful for what I learned while I was gone. I'm so thankful for the other pastors and Christian leaders I was able to meet. But I'm most thankful for time away with the Lord in prayer and in silence and even after all that travel to come back feeling rested and restored. Um, as I was going to the airport last week, I took an Uber and the driver asked me what airline I was on. I said, Alaska. He said, good luck. <laughs> there have been lots of cancellations. I'm happy to say, and this is not a paid endorsement, that both flights there and back went very well on Alaska. <laughs> Uh, but that was not the case for him. Two weeks prior, he had been flying. He uh, showed up at the airport in SeaTac at four in the morning to find that his flight was canceled. He stayed there all day, uh, waiting for a new flight, which he never was able to find, and they were not able to help him to find. So late in the afternoon, early in the evening, he went home. And he told me, it was especially heartbreaking for him because he was on his way to his father's funeral. And he did not get to go, and he talked about the sadness of that, and, and I said, were you able to watch it online? He said, 
yeah, but <laughs> that is not the same. You know, it's just such a, it's just not the same. And so I just told him how sorry I was for him. And, and this has been a, a challenge for us. I know here in this congregation over the past couple years, we've had some friends who have passed away who had memorial services that were put on hold, postponed, and in some cases even canceled. And we've had people join us for these memorials online and trying to do the best we can. It remains an ongoing challenge for us as a church trying to emerge from COVID-19. Well, I think about all of this this morning because as we continue in 2 Samuel and we look to the life of David, today we will see that he also missed a funeral for his own son, Absalom. He missed it because there was no funeral. Uh, his son was killed and buried under a big pile of rocks. There was no closure for David. In the end, we were just left with David's grief. And as we've been going through David's story after week after week, and we've seen the highs and lows, today we, we come to the next chapter. And yet, through it all, we continue to look for God's presence and goodness. So, I want to invite you to turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 18, if you have your Bible with you. We're also going to put the words on the screen for you. We are going to read uh, from a couple of different sections of this chapter. Uh, the first few verses are all military strategy, as David and his troops get together and they decide what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. So I encourage you to read that. There's also a middle section uh, that, that we're, we're not going to look at as closely today. But I encourage you to, to go back later today to, to read through the whole chapter if you're able uh, to try to get a, a deeper sense of what's happening through all of this chapter. But for today, we're going to begin this morning at verse 5. This is God's word. The king, David, commanded Joab, Abishai, and Ittai, be gentle with the young man, Absalom, for my sake. And all the troops heard the king giving orders concerning Absalom to each of the commanders. David's army marched out of the city to fight Israel, and the battle took place in the forest of Ephraim. There Israel's troops were routed by David's men, and the casualties that day were great, 20,000 men. The battle spread out over the whole countryside, and the forest swallowed up more men that day than the sword. Now Absalom happened to meet David's men. He was riding his mule, and as the mule went under the thick branches of a large oak, Absalom's hair got caught in the tree. He was left hanging in midair, while the mule he was riding kept on going. When one of the men saw what had happened, he told Joab, I just saw Absalom hanging in an oak tree. Joab said to the man who had told him this, What? You saw him? Why didn't you strike him to the ground right there? Then I would have had to give you ten shekels of silver and a warrior's belt. But the man replied, Even if a thousand shekels were weighed out into my hands, I would not lay a hand on the king's son. In our hearing, the king commanded you and Abishai and Ittai, protect the young man Absalom for my sake. And if I had put my life in jeopardy and nothing is hidden from the king... You would have kept your distance from me, Joab said. I'm not going to wait like this. I'm not going to wait like this for you. So he took three javelins in his hand and plunged them into Absalom's heart while Absalom was still alive on the oak tree. And ten of Joab's armor bearers surrounded Absalom, struck him, and killed him. Then Joab sounded the trumpet and the troops stopped pursuing Israel for Joab halted them. They took Absalom threw him into a big pit in the forest and piled up a large heap of rocks over him. Meanwhile, all the Israelites fled to their homes. So now the news needs to be shared with David. So two messengers are sent. And now we go to verse 29, where David asked this question. The king asked, is the young man Absalom safe? Ahamaz answered, I saw great confusion just as Joab was about to send the king's servant and me, your servant, but I don't know what it is. The king said, stand aside and wait here. So he stepped aside and stood there. 
Then the Cushite arrived and said, My lord, the king, hear the good news. The Lord has vindicated you today by delivering you from the hand of all who rose up against you. The king asked the Cushite, Is the young man Absalom safe? The Cushite replied, May the enemies of my lord, the king, and all who rise up to harm you be like that young man. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We pray today that you would open your word to our hearts that we might be able to understand it in a new way. We pray not just for ourselves, we pray for those who are with us. So we take a moment to, to pray for those who are seated on our right, that they might hear the word that God has for them today. We pray also for those seated on our left. I ask that you take a moment to pray for me as I prepare to preach. And finally, pray for yourself that you would hear the word that God has for you. And all of these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As many of you know, I grew up in Iowa, and in school, like all of you, I learned there about the American Civil War. But it was not until moving to Nashville for college that I really started to gain interest uh, there, being surrounded by battlefields and buildings that still had bullet holes in them. um, The stories started to come alive. And there in Nashville, I met and married a girl who grew up just a few miles from Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. So that was really interesting for me every time we would go back and we would visit the battlefield in Gettysburg. The Civil War fractured this country and many families within. We have heard many stories about brother against brother and father against son, Absalom's versus David's. And that's what we read here today. We are reading about a civil war that is taking place in Israel. And as you were reading, I don't know if this verse stood out to you, but it certainly stands out to me. Listen to this again. In verse 7, there Israel's troops were routed by David's men. Israel's troops routed by David's men. And the casualties that day were great. 20,000 men. 20,000, that's significant. It's similar to the second battle of Bull Run or Antietam. And likely the numbers would have been more had Joab not called off the fight, had not blown the trumpet after Absalom's death. So we're in the middle of this great conflict. And after Absalom's death, what did we read? All Israel fled to their homes. But let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to what we read at the beginning. We've seen David's great highs and great lows. We've seen David being magnanimous. We've seen David being absolutely lustful, sinful, a murderer. Today, we witness David's grief and compassion. And this first verse, it stands out so sharply as David talks to his his generals, his commanders, about Absalom, his son, the very one who's pursuing them, who's trying to kill David, the king says to his generals, to his military leaders, be gentle on the young man. Be gentle on the young man. Everyone heard him say it. Everyone heard it. This young man who had staged a coup against David, this young man who had taken over his palace, 
And yet David showed compassion. Just as David had shown compassion for Saul when Saul had tried to kill him. The battle took place, we read, in the forest of Ephraim. And that's an important detail because when a battle takes place in a forest, uh, the tactics change. Especially when horses or mules are involved. I don't know if any of you watched the Preakness Stakes yesterday. Uh, I, I'm not a big horse racing fan, but I did read the Black Stein as a kid and watch the movie, which I love. So every once in a while, you know, you know I, the big races I, I watch. And so I watched yesterday. And uh, one thing I noticed about the Preakness Stakes yesterday, there were no trees. <laughs> there were no trees in the middle of the track. I don't know if you've ever noticed that about horse racing. They're not slaloming around trees. Just a clear track. I've been horseback riding before uh, in my life. It's been a long time. But when I was in college, uh, there, this is before I met my wife, there was a young woman who was, I was interested in, and she asked me to go horseback riding, and I said, yes, why would I not? What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> but it was not a gentle horseback riding kind of situation where you're getting on the horse, kind of going down a trail for many miles, you know, and slow I experienced that. I remember when I was a, ki a little kid, the first time going horseback riding, my horse was named Cash. It was this black horse, this old horse, nice slow walk through the hillside. That's not what this was. I got on this horse that had not been ridden in a long time, and it was raring to go. I got on this horse, and yes, it started as a nice walk, but the walk became a trot, the trot became a gallop, and the gallop did not stop. And so I'm holding off for dear life on this horse because I am not going to fall. And then all of a sudden I notice this horse is going straight at a tree. And I'm thinking, what is this horse doing? Can it not see the tree that is straight ahead? And then I realized what the horse was doing. As it veered right before we got to the tree, and there were all these low-hanging branches. And I thought, this horse is trying to knock me off. It does not want me on. And I got as small as I could. And I survived. I stayed on the horse. I kept my honor. <laughs> um, thankfully, I did not have longer hair at the time. <laughs> but of course, this was no laughing matter for Absalom and his long hair. As he was riding his mule and his branch got, his hair got stuck in the branch of this oak tree. And he was hanging there between heaven and earth in midair, stuck. And it is strangely fitting for Absalom that this thing that provided for him his great pride, his great vanity, his hair, would lead to his demise. If you've been here with us the past couple weeks or you're familiar with 2 Samuel, you know that Absalom was very good looking, very handsome. And his hair, his hair was so beautiful so long, so thick, that when they cut his hair, they had to weigh it. And they were not weighing it because he was going to give it away to some worthy charity. They were weighing it to show how great Absalom was. Eugene Peterson writes this, His hair, his famous hair, symbol of his beauty and virility, is now the means by which he is rendered helpless, defenseless, in the midst of the fighting I mean, I think there's a, an important thing to think about there. We could talk about our pride leading to a fall. And that's certainly what we see happening here. But what happened was that Joab killed Absalom. He took three javelins. He could not wait for his inept guard to do the work. He could not wait for this man who was trying to follow the king's orders no, he immediately went and put three spears in Absalom's heart. Then his ten armor bearers came around him, joining in the massacre. And Absalom was thrown into a pit, covered with stones. Joab paid no attention to David's command to be gentle with this young man. In fact, just the opposite. And Joab, of course, had been in many battles. Joab had been there. He was the one to receive the word from David as Uriah went to the front lines, saying, put, put Uriah up there. And don't be concerned about it when he dies. 
what must, must have been going through Joab's mind as he had been thinking through all of these battles that he had experienced with, with David. We're going to look more into that next week. But then David hears the news. And David wept. Everything that had happened before, his son leaving him, and then wanting to return to the city and return to Jerusalem where David would not see him for two years. He said, no, he cannot come into this palace. He had ignored his son for two years, and yet he loved his son. He loved his son Absalom, and when his son died, he cries out, oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. That's three Absaloms and five my sons. Repeated over and over, crying out in deep and utter anguish. I consider it a great and humbling honor to be a pastor. I get to spend many moments of, well, great highs and great lows with family. And it's amazing how many times you can walk into a room and feel like you're instantly a part of a family when something is, is going on. To be there shortly after the birth of a child and to be there holding hand with a loved one as they're dying. Through it all, we look to God for our hope in both the weddings and the funerals. But I must say, it's been very sad for me because far too often I have had to oversee funerals for children, infants. One of the very first things I did here in Orcas Island was to lead through a funeral for a baby boy. And it's never easy. If a wife loses a husband, she becomes a widow. If a husband loses a wife, he becomes a widower. If a child loses his or her parents, they become an orphan. But if a parent loses a child, there is no word for it. Because it's unnatural. It's unexpected. It's not supposed to happen. We don't have a word for it. Nicholas Wolterstorff writes about this in his book, uh, Lament for a Son. Lament for a Son. And in this book, Wolterstorff writes this. He says, It's so wrong, so profoundly wrong, for a child to die before its parents. It's hard enough to bury our parents, but that we expect. Our parents belong to our past. Our children belong to our future. We do not visualize our future without them. How can I bury my son, my future, one of the next in line? He was meant to bury me. Voltersdorf recognizes the pain of anyone who has lost a child. When, when our parents die, we lament the memory. When our children die, we lament the future that will never be. And that includes people who have experienced miscarriage. And often that happens in silence where perhaps no one even knows what has happened. Soon enough, we will come to the end of 2 Samuel. I've heard from many of you how you have really enjoyed going through this book and hearing these stories that perhaps you've never heard preached before. Um, some of you are perhaps looking forward to the next book of the Bible. <laughs> I've not heard from you so much. <laughs> uh, perhaps these stories, these very difficult stories, can be hard to stomach, and indeed they are. This is, as we have said, earthy spirituality here. But one of the things that we know about Scripture is that it deals with all of life. It does not hide from the difficult stuff. We look to the great songbook, the great hymn book of the Bible, the Psalms, of which one third of them are laments. If we were to open up our hymn book here, or our song list of songs we sing, you will not find that one third of them are laments. Today, we prefer to keep our lament and our sorrow tucked away in a private closet and only to share with one another our great achievements and great joy. And yet the Bible teaches us in community to mourn with those who mourn, to rejoice with those who rejoice. 
And there's no greater example of this than Jesus Christ himself, who at the tomb of Lazarus wept. Jesus wept. And Jesus wept knowing that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And yet he still wept. Why would he do that? Were his tears fake? No. Jesus entered into the grief with us. In Jesus, we have a high priest who understands our highest highs and our lowest lows. And so now, I want to give you three easy steps for getting over grief. No. I'm not going to do that. It seems that's what the world would prefer, though, that we would just get over it. The casseroles come for a little while. The casseroles show up for the first couple of weeks. But then after a couple of months, I mean, it's time to move on, right? I mean, you should be over it by now. I mean, right? We feel this pressure. We don't know how to mourn for the long one. We don't know how to, how to work with other people who mourn. We don't know how to, to live with that pain. And next week, we're going to see Joab criticizing David for his grief. What's your problem? Get over it. We're going to, look at, we're going to see that next week. But when we look at this passage, it ends with lament. It ends with David's grief. David's grief. So what are we to do with this? How does the gospel, the good news, inform our understanding of grief? As Christians, we know we, we are called to grieve as those with hope, not as those who have no hope. We're called to grieve with hope. And yet, the pain is still there. I, I want to look once again to um, the words of Nicholas Walterstorff here, who has experienced this, this pain He writes this. He said, elements of the gospel, which I had always thought would console me, did not, did not in that moment. They did something else, something important, but not that. I did not grieve as one who has no hope. Yet Eric is gone. Here and now he is gone. Now I cannot talk with him. Now I cannot see him. Now I cannot hug him. Now I cannot hear of his plans for the future. That is my sorrow. A friend said to me, remember, he's in good hands. I was deeply moved. But that reality does not put Eric back in my hands now. The grief is still there. Even though we have hope, we still live in that moment with this present reality. Years later, and Walter Storff writes this in the introduction to the book, he was asked this question. Uh, he says, rather often I am asked whether the grief remains as intense as when I wrote this book. The answer is no. The wound is no longer raw, but it has not disappeared. That is as it should be. If he was worth loving, he is worth grieving over. Grief is existential testimony to the worth of the one loved. That worth abides. So I own my grief. I do not try to put it behind me, to get over it, to forget it. I do not try to disown it. If someone asks, who are you? Tell me about yourself. I say, not immediately, but shortly. I am one who has lost a son. That loss determines my identity. Not all of my identity, but much of it. It belongs within my story. I struggle indeed to go beyond merely owning my grief toward owning it redemptively. But I will not, and I cannot disown it. I shall remember Eric. Lament is a part of my life. I don't know how you hear those words. For some of you who have experienced this grief, perhaps they're all too real for you. But grief is not something we just get over. But with God's help, we can be transformed. And over time, the wound is not quite so raw. David, even in his grief, is also an encouragement to us. And all throughout the Psalms, even in the midst of lament, David points to hope in the Lord. And as we read from Psalm 34 in our call to worship this morning, 
The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. What beautiful words. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He saves those who are crushed in spirit. Why? Why would the Lord be close? We know. We know. Because God knows our grief. Sometimes the songs of scripture, or just songs in general, or sometimes artwork, uh, poetry, can help us express where we're at in ways that we might not normally be able to. Several years ago, I directed an artist residency in Vancouver, British Columbia. In fact, the church Randy was pastoring was one of the sponsor churches, and one of our artist friends, uh, Matt Whitney, who's shown work here, made a painting called Absalom, Absalom. It is a diptych, and that means the painting has two parts. Oftentimes, altarpieces in uh, churches are diptychs. There are two parts to it. But you see on the right, um, it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but you can see Absalom with the javelins in his heart and the tree. And you can also see on the left, David, creating this altar of mourning. And it's interesting to me to think of David and his grief. We see these stones. He's, is, he's, is David building an altar of remembrance? Or is he imagining his son dead under a pile of rocks? He's in grief. Perhaps David is at risk of hardening his heart. But in the end, these stones will stumble away. Sometimes art helps us to, to see a story in a different way. I realize I'm not leaving you with any easy answers this morning, but I do want to leave you with this. God enters into the grief with us. God enters into the grief with us. God knows what it is like to lose a son. God knows what it is like in Jesus Christ to experience death and yet even greater to experience resurrection. And this does give us great hope. It does give us great hope. Because God did conquer death. And how did that happen? Listen one more time to David's lament here at the end of this chapter. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and as he wept, he said, oh, my son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, if only I had died in your place. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. How many parents have said that about their children who have passed away? If only they could have died in their child's place. But what David could not do, Jesus did. Jesus died in the place of his rebellious children. Jesus died in the place of those who were out to kill him. Jesus died in the place of you and me. Yes, death comes for us all, but Jesus has made a way to a greater life. And what David could not do, Jesus does completely fully, perfectly, and for all of us. It's the mystery of the good news of the gospel. I pray that you would receive this gift today. I have overseen many funerals. I've played music for many funerals. I've spoken at many funerals. I've attended many funerals. At any, every single funeral that I've ever been a part of leading, there is one passage of scripture that is read every time. A Psalm of David, Psalm 23, which ends with these great words of comfort. Surely your goodness, your love, your mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Had David already written these words before Absalom had died? I, I don't know the full timeline. But these words... I believe God had already planted in his heart. And these words are words that we are going to sing together now.
as we close our time in worship. So I want to invite you to sing with me. For those who grieve this day, Lord, we give thanks that in Christ we do not need to grieve as those without hope. We pray for hope this day. For those who are experiencing loss and, and the woundedness that comes with that, Lord, we pray for your comfort. And we pray that you would give us grace as people gathered in this place to live well alongside our brothers and sisters who need our love. Lord, we thank you in the midst of it all for the gift of life, for the gift of breath, for the gift of this day, for the gift of your presence with us, for the gift of eternity in the house of the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Not done quite yet. I feel like I'm being played off. I'm played off of the platform. Although that would have been a good time to end, yes. But I have one more verse. I have one more verse as a verse of, of a benediction and a blessing this morning. And uh, we want to invite you downstairs afterwards. Um, say hello to someone new you haven't met before. 
Um, and uh, thank you for being here. But now, hear these words of blessing and these words of hope and glory from the Apostle Paul. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let us all say together, Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We hope to have you join us again for worship next Sunday at 10 a.m. If you are interested in worshiping with us on the OICC campus, keep in mind that we strictly adhere to all state and county guidelines. Our commitment to our community is to stay safe and healthy so as to keep us gathering together at church. We do hope you can join us either online or at church at 176 Madrona Street in East Sound, Washington. If you're new to the church, we'd love to hear from you. Also, don't forget to tell your friends on island or around the world. If you can't join us in person, join us at orcaschurch.org at 10 a.m. Pacific time. As you may know, there are a lot of great things happening at OICC. Here are a few of those events happening online on our events page at orcaschurch.org slash events, as well as the church campus. There you can find out the details of what's happening each week, including men's and women's Bible studies, middle school and high school group events, kids ministry events, and others. Again, that webpage is orcaschurch.org slash events. We look forward to having you join us next week online or in person at church at OICC. On behalf of the staff and families at Orcas Island Community Church, have a great day today. God bless you.